Yeah. Well, Elvis, thank you for giving me your time. <laughs> Absolute pleasure, Jano. Um, nice to meet you. Pleasure. Uh, and, oh, uh, sorry, sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah, right. Yeah. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I'll edit that out. <laughs> now, I've been, um, well, you know, I've been meaning to want to wanna sit down and, and do, um, obviously, use my platform to be able to kind of uh, introduce, you know, you to, I guess, a lot of people in the fight game know who you are, but um, I have my platform and my podcast. It's called Into the Deep, and the whole idea is to celebrate the Australian culture, uh, whether it's music, sports, whatever it is, and... Um, you know, um, and for a lot of people that may know, you know, your history, know that um, you're very important to the Australian culture in my eyes anyway, and um, and what you've done for MMA. So, um, and um, obviously you have the, you, you trained some people that I know, obviously we've spoken about it and Adam and Harry made sure they told me that I had enough space uh, in my memory when I talk to you because they said you're going to need it. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I can, uh, I'm a bit of a talker. Yeah, I they, can they, they know, to... I chew their ears off, uh, you know, Harry's ear off every time I talk. So, you guys, you guys it's going to be good when you guys get together. But um, I appreciate you giving me your time. I know that, um, you know, it can be quite busy and whatnot. So, um, but um, I kind of wanted to dive into just, I guess, the origin story and kind of, you know, I have a few questions in my mind that hopefully kind of lead to, to our conversation. But... Um, I guess for those, you know, that don't know, um, tell me a little bit about the origin story of Elvis, um, you know, kind of, you, you know, your background and even just way before you kind of entering the MMA scene, tell me a little bit about yourself and where you've come from and kind of your journey um, to MMA, I guess. Well, I'm kind of lucky, um, or you're kind of lucky, I should say. Mm -hmm. we, we're kind of combining uh, art and sport together because I do think the martial arts, um, are an artistic interpretation of a sporting or combat situation so kind of some interesting elements hopefully will come up in the, this chat mm. um, so I've been around for a long time nearly 50 years nearly half a century so I grew up in Canberra uh, I was obviously with a name like Elvis I got picked on a little bit at, at school <laughs> um, so you know I was kind of thin, not overly athletic, I uh, was quite uh, studious, so um, thankfully I've you know, managed to retain a lot of my intellect that I had when I was younger, uh, because through the years of uh, combat sports, uh, that can uh, change sometimes, mm. uh, thankfully not so much for myself. So, you know, I just grew up in Canberra, uh, I was your average nerdy sort of kid, played a bit of Dungeons and Dragons, played a little bit of soccer, um, got picked on occasionally, not not anything m major, but you know it happens when you're um, when you're a little bit different, you know. And so one of my idols growing up was Bruce Lee. So you know I watched all the Bruce Lee movies, and he kind of he's probably what inspired me to get into the martial arts because I thought if I could do martial arts, then you know I'd be able to protect myself. I wouldn't have to worry about bullies and um, things like that. So um, my primary school had a judo program come up and obviously as a child, I didn't know the difference. My parents just, I said, I want to do martial arts. There was a judo class, that was martial arts. So they put me into it. It was good for the parents uh, because you know, it was an evening class. So they get a couple of hours at home without the kids because they put all, the, all us uh, kids into the class. I started training. Funnily enough, it was a grappling style at the time. That's not what I wanted. I wanted to punch and kick, but um, as we know with the MMA, it eventually came around full circle, so it did pay dividends in the long run, starting with the judo. Um, from there, I moved into Taekwondo. I did that for a few years um, through high school, and then once I got to college, I kind of stopped. I was kind of, oh no, I was still doing my martial arts into college. It wasn't until I got into university, I ended up studying uh, IT. Um, at the University of Canberra and because of the, the study I just uh, I ended up stopped my martial arts training while I was at university but to kind of compensate because you know I, I was quite an active child I always used to play outside ride on my bike run around with the dogs dig in the garden get in trouble for that sort of stuff um, I wanted to kind of stay active while at university so me and my friends decided that um, we'd put aside, you know, a couple of days each week at lunchtime um, to go out, 
And it was only on the, obviously, at the university campus, but they had a gym and all that facility. But we'd go there and play different sports. So, you know, for a month we'd play soccer, and then for a month we'd play tennis, and mm. a month we'd play badminton, and then a month we played uh, volleyball, and then I actually quite enjoyed the, um, the volleyball, and then from there we ended up joining um, a social volleyball league, and uh, so we made friends, so I started doing that, uh, which ended up actually taking up evening time, which was the whole reason I stopped the martial arts was so I had evenings free to study. But, you know, I still, I, I ended up doing that once a week. And then while, I think it was at the, our team made the finals for the, the, the mixed social league volleyball. And while I was, we were there competing, the, the state league uh, coach was uh, kind of scouting the, the social uh, players and he noticed me and he called me over and said hey are you interested in playing some state league volleyball and I'm like sure you know I really don't know what I'm doing yes. he says, don't worry we'll teach you how to do it so <laughs> yeah. I ended up joining the state league volleyball which then progressed to uh, beach volleyball um, wow. so I started traveling to Sydney uh, to play beach um, and then I finished university, started working full time because I was traveling up to Sydney playing beach volleyball, met a girl up here who was studying university um, in Sydney and then I'm like, okay, and then I discovered while in Canberra, uh, I, the, I wanted to get back into martial arts, so I, uh, in my first job, I think it was uh, Ozabe, um, which was ADAB I think when I started. I had an old high school friend come up to me and goes, hey, are you still doing, like he do, did Kyokushin Karate, he knew I did Taekwondo, and he's like, oh, are you still training the martial arts? I went, no, I kind of stopped when I got to uni. He goes, oh, check this out. And he hands me a tape of UFC 2. Wow. And I'm like, oh, okay. So I take the tape home and I, you know, so what, on, on VHS. <laughs> what, what was the period, like time frame in terms of year and time? Like what, what would have this been around? I think that would have been about 95. 95, so, okay. So, um, Yeah, I think I graduated about 90, 90 might have been 94 even yeah, actually. Yeah, I think 90, it might have been yeah, 94, yeah. 93, 94. Um, he handed me this tape of UFC 2 and this skinny little Brazilian choking people out. And I'm like, whoo, this looks cool. So um, you know, I started looking up the magazines and uh, I found Blitz and John Will was traveling around the world and he met these great people called the Gracies and then the Machados. Mm. So then it kind of linked up to what I was seeing on the UFC, the VHS tape. So I started tape trading. Uh, overseas to get more UFC events and then instructional videos and and then I kind of got to the point where you know things were getting serious with my girlfriend um, I was playing beach more and I wanted to find a jiu-jitsu school and the closest place was Sydney so mm. um, while in Canberra I actually started training at a Jun fan club which again goes back to the the Bruce Lee um, era and they had um, stick fighting, your Kali Eskrima, um, Esparta Yadaga. So we did stick and knife work. We had the Muay Thai and then a little bit of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu grappling because the, the Jun Fan stuff was the old, like Jeet Kune Do, it was kind of takes what's useful and dis disregard what's not. And so I kind of started enjoying that. And so that kind of motiva motivated me to, to, to move up to Sydney. So I ended up deciding to move up to Sydney. Um, came up here, found um, Lang, Langy's MMA. So Anthony Langy had a school up there. So I moved up into Leichhardt. Uh, the gym was in Manly. So it was a bit of a, so I was working, ended up starting with Microsoft. So I was living in Leichhardt, traveling to ride, coming back home and then going out to Manly to train and coming back. So I ended up moving into uh, Cremorne on the North Shore, living out that way. Um, and that pretty much started um, my journey into uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, which then led into, led into MMA. Um, when I first saw that tape of UFC 2, I kind of said to myself, you know what, I really want to give this a go one day. Uh, not because I wanted to become famous or win a world title. For me, it was about uh, testing myself. Like, um, you know, as I said, I got picked on as a kid, so I wanted to know, well, Let's say I get into a confrontation as an adult. 
does what I've been training work? You know, mm. will it actually work under a, a stressful situation? And the other thing I wanted to test was my own personal fortitude, my courage. Um, it's one thing to know what to do, but then it's another thing to be able to do it, to have, to be confronted with someone who wants to um, hurt you and then to be able to draw on that, those skills and knowledge and, and apply them. Because, you know, I'd heard a lot of horror stories about people who'd been training karate for years and they go out and they get into a, a fight in a pub and they get beat up because they freeze on the spot because they haven't been training with contact and things like that. Mm. So I really want to step into like a, the UFC and, and give it a go. What was MMA like around that time? Because um, obviously, you know, UFC, it was UFC 2 you're talking about. So what was MMA like in Australia? In compared, obviously now it's just like, you know. So at, at, spot, at that point it didn't exist. It, it, it yeah, didn't exist. Was, yeah, yeah. So uh, even MMA didn't exist. Mm. So that's kind so of a, a, a really modern interpretation yeah. of it. Back then it was known as no holds barred. Really? Okay. Um, yeah. And if you talk, the, the, the Brazilian Portuguese term was vale tudo, which stood for anything goes. So mm. um, in the UFC, the basic rules were no biting, no eye gouging, no fish hooking, mm. which is... Mm. Um, so they were the only three rules in the UFC when it first started. Um, no holds barred. So there was no events. The closest thing was there was some kind of sports jiu-jitsu tournaments where they had uh, uh, non-contact striking or touch contact striking with... Um, when you take someone down, you had, you know, 30 seconds grappling on the ground. So they had some of those events mm. and I had competed in those events as well. Um, but no, no MMA or no, no holds barred um, until about, uh, I think, 96, 90, 97. So I moved up to Sydney in 95 and 97. Um, this ad turned up in the Blitz magazine. It was called Australasian Ultimate Fighting Championships. And I'm like, oh, this is awesome. This is what I wanted to do. Now, it ended up not being at all UFC. Um, the promoter ended up getting sued by the, well, threats of legal action to be sued yeah. by the UFC. So when he actually released the VHS tapes, um, it got rebranded as Cage Con Combat 1 because he wasn't allowed to use the, the UFC name mm. or anything. But when I saw that, I kind of said to myself, you know, this is what I want. I want to give it a go. I want to step in there once, test myself, see what happens. So I kind of contacted the, the promoter and said, hey, look, I want to fight, and he goes, oh, look, send me your um, fight history, your competition, your, your belt ranks. You know, back then, I, I didn't have a lot. You know, I was a black belt in Taekwondo, um, still you know, like a green belt or blue belt in Judo, it's not very high in that. Um, I was doing some Jiu-Jitsu, but I was like, the, I think a green belt, which was the equivalent of a four-stripe white belt, or mm. I may not have, I may have even been lower when I first contacted him about it. Um, but pretty much a white belt equivalent in jiu-jitsu. And um, I'd won some uh, national all-styles point fighting tournaments while I was in Canberra. I'd won a few uh, point fighting competitions and I'd, a couple of grappling competitions here and there, a um, couple of second and third places. So nothing really um, spectacular. And he's like, look, you know, we've got uh, world-class kickboxers who want to be on the show and wrestlers and all these big names. And um, look, we'll keep you on our books, but look, you're probably not going to get a chance to fight. And I'm like, look, if they have an alternate spot, I'll jump into that um, or anything. And so he's like, look, I'll, I'll keep you on thing. And I pretty much called him nearly every day. Hey, hey, Randy, what's going on? <laughs> he's like, yeah, good. No, no, sorry, no spots. And then one day, you know, then I kind of was calling him every day for a while. And then I kind of went, well, nothing's happening. So I kind of stopped calling him. And then after about a week, I get a phone call from Randy. Randy's like, how would you like to be in the UFC? And I'm like, oh, what? Um, and then, you know, spotted up, opened up. Basically, all the, the big name fighters who'd been given the opportunity to step into, who were saying they were going to do it, started learning more about what was involved, realizing how hard it was and how difficult. And they didn't, they weren't as likely to win as they thought they yeah. were. So they all started dropping off and... So you had um, been competing leading up to this point? Yeah, I was just court? doing... Um, like just local fights? Local just fight. local yeah, competitions, yeah, 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 just yeah, some yeah, grappling yeah. competitions. Yeah. Um, I wasn't even winning them, honestly, at the time. You know, yeah. I was getting seconds and thirds. I, I may have won 
one or two along the way as well. Yeah. Um, you know, but it was all part of the, the learning, the journey and all that sort, sort of thing. And he goes, you know, would you like to step in? I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, I ended up stepping into the cage and it kind of stuck, stuck with it from there. It was, as I said, at first it was more of a, t a, a personal test. And that first time, the exhilaration, the crowd, the cheering, uh, I just got, even now I'm getting the tingles. It was just such an amazing experience. Um, admittedly, winning the first match, you know, helped a lot. Um, mm. I don't know, maybe if I'd lost the mat first match, I might not have yeah, yeah. Um, followed that one up. But, I, you know, I won that first fight. I ended up losing the next match. Um, but it just got me so excited and it was something I wanted to do. And so, you know, I kind of chased it up. I got another opportunity in 98 to fight again. But then because we were so far from the rest of the world, that pretty much I kind of stopped MMA or no holds barred as it was known back then for about uh, two years until about 2000. So um, I kept training, I kept doing uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, a little bit of Thai boxing and some boxing here and there um, during that time. But yeah, you know, it was a pretty crazy time. No one really knew anything about it. It was very new, it was very raw. There's a lot of self-discovery um, and obviously a lot of um, pioneering involved. At the time, you know, I wasn't thinking of it like that way. But yeah. as I look back, you kind of realize, you know, those first steps that I took. Uh, it's a bit like, you know, um, a, one small step for man, one giant <laughs> leap for mankind. And so uh, it was a bit like that for the martial arts. And did you notice, um, was there much of a difference in the level of... Uh I guess skills and the level of uh, demand of MMA in the US when you kind of went over from in, compared, in comparison to Australia? Like, did you notice that it had already kind of not so much established because obviously it took some time, but in comparison to Australia at that time and that time frame that you were there, did you notice the difference? Did you kind of notice that there oh, were... Oh, look, there was definitely, like, obviously, I didn't get to the US until 2001. I yeah. uh, fought in... Japan in, in 98 and then back in and then 2000 I ended up going to Canada and um, Japan as well so by then I kind of had a good idea of what needed to be done I was al already a training appropriately um, but the main thing that was a little bit different to the US versus Australia even back in 2000 is um, no one here knew about it mm. like even the hardcore fans were very small um, the community was pretty much spread across and it was just people um, via what was known as tape trading. So the UFC kind of had a difficult time for a while. It went underground. You know, it had started in, in 1992 with uh, Hoist Gracie and SEG. And then the first couple of years were very big. And then a lot of uh, politicians were fighting to get it banned. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they got taken off pay-per-view or um, so you know the sport kind of struggled for a few years and what kind of kept it alive was what was known as um, tape trading so that they were having small um, pay-per-view events on satellite and things like that on small um, stations and things through the yes through the US and so people were recording it and then sending it overseas and we're swapping tapes of events from Japan and Brazil and the US as well as you know, I'd buy an instructional series, I'd record, make a copy, and then I would send a copy of that for a copy of a fight. And um, so that's kind of, kind of what kept it going. So no, I, over here, it was only the hardcore fans who kind of knew about mm, what mm. was going on. So obviously, the majority of the people training over here for, the, for martial arts were still very single style um, focused. Um, admittedly, John Well was probably, probably doesn't get enough credit for how revolutionary he was at the time because um, when I started training Machado Jiu-Jitsu through him he already had an understanding of to be a complete martial artist you needed striking, wrestling, grappling, um, th those three primary elements mm. for to be a complete fighter and he had a you know he had his shoot fighting system um, in place because of it and uh, Interestingly enough, he, he probably got a lot of um, backlash from the more purists because he was cross-training and mixing stuff up. Even the traditional Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu community were kind of like, 
it's not jujitsu. What do you need all this sort of stuff for? Hoist Gracie doesn't need it. You oh, know? right, right. Because at that point, it was still like, which because one is it the was, more dominant? Yeah, because yeah, yeah, it was, yeah, it was yeah, still yeah, style yeah. By, yeah, versus yeah. style. So it took a few years for the sport to really evolve. And then once people started learning the different elements and how to defend certain mm. elements of a style, um, your ability to, to be successful did rely on your access to a wider variety of skill sets. Mm. Um, and John recognized that early. Like now he's predominantly focused on um, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu with his um, Will Machado Jiu Jitsu Association. But back then, you know, mm. um, it's quite impressive what, what he realized and what he was doing um, back then. And, you know, I, I took a, a lot of to that yourself. approach. Yeah, 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 like I realized um, watching the, the MMA tapes that. Yeah, it's great to be a good grappler, but if you can't get the person to the ground, it's no good. And if the person's a better grappler and I don't want to go to the ground, I've got to make sure I can stay on my feet. And if I mm. stay on my feet, I've got to make sure I can beat them standing. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I, I kind of realized that in my training at that time, pretty much straight away, as, as soon as I've discovered the sport, I was already cross-training and looking at cross-training um, to get to maximize my benefits. and. It's one of the things I, I think a lot of the people um, and the, the students today, even my students probably don't realize is back then I probably had, I don't know, six to eight different club memberships. So I had like, um, because I did shift work and I worked um, different shifts and I ended up move, working at, in different parts of Sydney because I was contracting and doing IT. Um, I ended up at one point with um, a jiu-jitsu gym membership for the daytime, a jiu-jitsu gym membership for the nighttime, a Muay Thai membership for the daytime, a Muay Thai membership for the nighttime, a boxing gym membership, a <laughs> wrestling gym membership, um, a weights gym membership, uh, all this. I'm paying like all, all these the different yeah. um, memberships um, to, to be able to just train. And not only that, none of them were close to it. They were all in. So I had a membership in Homebush, in Parramatta, uh, in Hornsby, in Manly, in Leichhardt. Um, and I, I think even one of my gym memberships uh, was in, in the cross. So like, I was literally traveling all over Sydney, paying memberships everywhere, just to be able to train effectively to um, be competitive in um, no holds barred MMA as we know it today. Um, so when people come here and they have everything under one roof, we have Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, Muay Thai, kickboxing, wrestling, boxing, MMA, hot yoga, kids and adults, not only the, the training, but the recovery, the ice bath, the sauna, the hot yoga, the hyperbaric oxygen change, but the strength and conditioning room and everything can be done under one membership. And when someone goes, oh, that's expensive. I go, you don't know what expensive is <laughs> until you're paying eight different memberships and traveling or not only is it the expense of the membership, but the petrol and the, the time involved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it takes a toll on you eventually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I still did it. And then I was working two jobs. So I had um, my weekday job and then I did security on the weekends. Then I was teaching at my academy and then I had to have a personal life. It's like, People go, I don't have the time or I don't have the money. I go, I kind of think to myself, I go, no, you do. You just don't have the desire. Mm. If you have the desire, you have the will, you can achieve whatever you want. Mm. If I could do it under those circumstances back then, you can do it today where you have everything under one roof. And, so. that, and that kind of brings me to my next question because I was, you know, listening to you and even from the time that you were coming up, I mean, it's crazy, right, for you to think now, like, the way we produce like world beaters now um, compared to, you know, you know, historically from pre, you know, yesteryears, yeah, a lot of it has to come down to the fact that like what you just mentioned in terms of the facilities, in terms of the, even the coaches, training partners, you know, um, just having it all under one house now that athletes, uh, you know, guys that are trying to be MMA fighters or have prospects of being MMA fighters have everything at their disposal um, and now, right? And that's probably a long way as to why the, the quality of fighters and, um, are being produced out of Australia now, and com you know? Um, I'm not saying in comparison to before, but you know what I mean? In, well, no, in, no, in you're right. Again, it, it ties yeah. into that previous yeah. question, what was the difference? And the difference was the sport yeah. wasn't well known over here. Yeah, so yeah. 
the coaches we had, we had a boxing coach, a wrestling coach, kickboxing coach, jiu-jitsu coach, but none of them understood it. And a lot of them, particularly the, like some of the old traditional boxing mm. coaches and wrestling coaches didn't like MMA. And so they wouldn't adjust what they were teaching you for what you need to do. Because I think that's it was important. Up, it, yeah, yeah, it was up to us. To I had to go to the boxing coach, yeah. learn to box. He would laugh about MMA and make fun of it. So I then had to take those skills and then reapply them for M specifically for, for MMA, MMA yeah. make the, the small adjustments. Um, wrestling was probably the biggest difference to uh, the overseas. They had a much stronger wrestling background for their, because even people who didn't compete at a high level still had wrestling at primary school and high school and whatever they call junior high and senior high. So you could st still wrestle without becoming a world-class wrestler and you had those skills which we were able to translate mm. into MMA. Whereas we really didn't have that in our, um, in our school system. Thankfully, you know, I had the judo background mm. and uh, one of the, what, the high school I went to actually had a, a teacher from overseas come for uh, I think a year or two at one of those teacher exchange programs. Mm. And he was thankfully a wrestling coach from the US. So oh, wow. he actually introduced wrestling for a yeah. couple of uh, terms at my high school. Um, so thank, I got to do that. I learned a little bit of wrestling and because of my judo background, I was able to kick everyone's ass at mm. school, which was fun. Mm. Um, but yeah, we were missing that um, integration of all the, the different mm. skill sets. We had to reach for different coaches to, to kind of be able to, to succeed. And then we had to be able to put it together. And, you know, I was lucky. I did have Anthony Lange who had, you know, he had fought in Shudo in Japan. He had, a, you know, an understanding of it. But even still, it was still a learning journey together. You know, we had to discover a lot of that, that cross state training stuff. Um, you know, MMA, the MMA community pretty much developed functional training. Like it was kind of there, but it was the MMA because it was so different to all your traditional sports, because it required explosiveness, but it required endurance, it required speed, but it required flexibility and balance. Um, it required all the different elements from different sports all in one sport. Mm. And so because of that, we had to kind of develop, you know, our own style of functional training. Like, so tire, we integrating tire flipping and battle ropes and throwing heavy bags and lifting and carrying stuff. So functional training really kind of took a, a real leap through the MMA community. And I'm not saying we created it or anything like that, but it was not a very well-known or understood or even appreciated um, type of physical training at the time. Back then it was all about you go to the gym, you push your weights, you had your free weights, you had your machine weights. And that's pretty much yeah. kind of where most of the focus was. But once the MMA community kind of got a hold of um, all the different training equipment, and now it's a much more integrated functional and strength and conditioning, your weight, your, your traditional mm -hmm. weights, your free weights, your machines with your functional training of battle ropes and skipping and heavy bags and doing all that. Um, to achieve the the level of fitness and strength and conditioning that's needed, and you would mi needed for and to MMA. mimic it as well, right? To mimic yeah. certain movements, and, and I then, think it's important to 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 kind of the reason I asked that question is because I felt like it was important for people to understand that that not everything was handed in a silver silver platter or dandy in the the in the in the, in the origin stories of MMA in Australia and yeah, and like and and how far it would have had to come in order for, for us to get to a point where you have all these facilities all over Sydney now that you know, have all the, all the, um, the technical um, equipment and whatnot in order to produce um, you know, um, athletes and high level fighters. And um, you know, I just think that it was important for people to understand that you know, it was literally starting from scratch and a lot of the things that got influenced through MMA was built, a, was a foundation um, pretty much in, um, in building a foundation for what we now kind of have now with cross training and all these things that you know that we use as part of our training as well uh, but when you think back to some of your fights um what are some of the some of the moments that really stand out to you um that you know you you know you were talking a little bit earlier when you were talking about you walking out for your first fight the shivers 
what what are some of the moments in 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 your career that especially in the ufc um that kind of really stand out to you that you remember you know uh, yeah. whether it's inside the cage outside the cage but just your experiences well look thankfully um i've had a fairly diverse um set of experiences i've been able to travel around the world so i'll, I'll try and keep it in a kind of chronological order um some of the probably strongest memories which kind of stand out Obviously, as I mentioned, um, the, the Australasian UFC Cage Combat won that first time walking out. Hearing the crowd chanting my name was just absolutely just... It was a massive thrill. It was inspiring. Um, but the biggest thing that really um, stands out is when I, you know, I walked into this cage and I'm on opposite times. This is my first time I'm in the cage. And you can see I'm kind of getting a little bit... Um, <laughs> amp because the memory is still so yeah, strong yeah. and and I'm, I'm standing across from this um opponent and i can see him i see the ref and the crowd and i'm kind of just i don't know where to focus and then all of a sudden this steel gate clang shut behind me and it's crazy my whole world just changed it's like everything just went and the only thing i could see and the only thing that mattered about the next minute was my opponent on the other side of the cage. Mm, mm. Um, thankfully, I won that match in about a minute. Knock, um, knock him out, TKO. Um, I think I knocked him out and then woke him up with some ground and pound. Um, but that was, it was kind of like everything disappeared. And then as soon as that ref has put his hand on me, and then everything's just come back out. And then suddenly I can hear the, the screaming and the cheering and the crowd. And then I'm like... The rush was just <clears throat> absolutely, again, goosebumps, yeah. was ridiculous. And that's kind of really what motivated me to kind of keep going, it's just that, that, that experience. Um, and then the next one was my, my first time traveling overseas, going to Japan to fight in rings. Um, I got thrown to the wolves. It was, it was pretty much, I got a like, short notice offer to go fight uh, Kyoshi Tamura. He was the number one rings uh, fighter in the, the Rings Association. So in Japan, there were three primary, um, what you would call kind of pro wrestling type organizations. They were kind of under the pro wrestling banner, but they weren't totally pro wrestling. Mm. They were kind of, they had the pro wrestling feel, but they were real fights. Mm. So it was mm. Rings, Pancras, and Shudo. So Shudo was considered the most real, um, and then Pancras and Rings were kind of what they call pro wrestling with shoots, where they had real matches mixed up with um, fake real matches or um, real matches with predetermined eddings. And so all my fights in Pancras and Rings were always the, the shoots or the real mm. matches. Um, and then as the, these sports continued to evolve, they eventually became totally shoot and, and only MMA um, events, but the, yeah, the first time going to Japan, the the culture, um, just the, just it was different. That's another beauty as well, right? Through your fighting, you got to also explore different cultures, and and and, and that's like some people will never know what that no, feels like, right? And to I, do, I, it, I probably, do it while you're doing something that you love, and and being able to explore that in a in a way like where you're not just you know oh. I'm taking leave from work and I'm going on holiday. You're doing something that you love and you get to go and explore different cultures. And, and let's be honest, someone know. else pays for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so it was just such a, uh, an amazing experience, you know, fighting in Japan. It was uh, like a 30, it was meant to be a 30 minute match. I'd never in my life trained for a, a 30 minute match. I ended yeah. up going 10 minutes. I lost the match. Um, but, you know, I put up a great fight. I ended up um, being the first MMA fighter to do a Goga Plata in uh, MMA, which... At the time, it was, the, the term Goga Plata didn't even exist. Um, I knew it as a shin choke. It was a move I uh, I had developed as a counter to defending an arm bar. And I'm not saying I invented the choke. Obviously, there were other people who developed the moves and things like that. You know, there's very little that's new in combat sports, but I hadn't seen it anywhere before, and I pulled it off. And then later on, it became known as the first Goga Plata in MMA. So that was a great experience. And then. In 2000, I ended up going to uh, Canada, Montreal specifically, the French-speaking area of Canada, 
and fighting for the UCC World Title, the UCC Universal Combat Challenge, later on uh, rebranded and became known as TKO, and TKO is the organisation that Georges St. Pierre mm. uh, came out of, so they developed a lot of high-level talent as well, so fighting for a world title um, <clears throat> in the UCC, again, travelling overseas, going to a country I probably never would have visited had it not been for MMA, and then um, that was, I think, October of 2000. And then in December of 2000, I got the opportunity to go to Japan again and fight Frank Shamrock at K1. And that was just one of the most amazing experiences, like, because it was almost 80,000 people in this, in, in this arena. Um, and I got to meet um, one of my idols, Hicks and Gracie was there. He was ringside. Wow. I got to go up and meet him. And then I met other great stars which people would later hear about like Ray Sefo, Stefan Lico, um, Mirko Krokop, um, uh, Jerome Labana, uh, but just all these mm. these massive you know vintage kickboxing names. Yeah, vintage yeah. names. Yeah, I got yeah. to meet all these people and in this in this arena it was just like probably one of the largest not only sporting events, but M like definitely the largest MMA event, but one of the largest combat sports events, uh, particularly at the time. Uh, it was just absolutely mind um, boggling at the time. And then to fight Frank Shamrock, who was the then five times UFC world champion, he was probably the first <clears throat> real cross-trained MMA fighter that really um, implemented striking, grappling, and um, wrestling all together. And, you know, he'd won matches in the UFC using striking, wrestling, and grappling mm. um, effectively. So, you know, that opportunity. And then that led into, um, because of fighting him, that led into my opportunity to step into the UFC and uh, fight Jeremy Horn. Um, because his opponent pulled out at the last second. They were looking for a replacement because I had history with Frank Shamrock, who was the last person to beat Jeremy Horn. Um, and because Frank didn't beat me, it went to a decision. I ended up losing the decision, but a lot of people thought it probably should have been a draw or I could have won. Irrelevant. I didn't get submitted by him. Jeremy did. So we had the history. And so the UFC basically put me in because they thought if Jeremy submitted me, then he would beat the guy that Frank couldn't beat, who was the last guy to beat him. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, they were so trying the stories to, all kind of tie yeah, in. Kind yeah, kind of tie the, the in. The theatrics, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so yeah. thankfully I ended up meeting, beating Jeremy um, in that UFC and it led to the king's finger points, good to be the king. Um, and then my career in the UFC and then it kind of built on to, you know, where we are today and yeah, all, a, a lot of other stuff they ended up doing. When you... Um I mean, I'm sure, uh, you know, you share your stories with your students and whatnot, but um, it's a two-part question. I'll start with the first one. Um, when you kind of look back at all those memories and when you look at, you know, what you've kind of built here, which is a great facility, by the way, guys, if you're in the area of, uh, of King's Academy, uh, make sure you come check it out. Moorbank, uh, near Bank, Liverpool, yeah, Liverpool, South West Sydney. Yeah, and um, even if you've got to get in the car and travel, you know, half of 40 minutes, it's definitely worth it. It's a... Uh, it's a great facility here that Elvis has built and um, what are some of the, you know, what are some of the thoughts and energy and, 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 and feelings that you feel like, I mean, um, you know, especially when you now, you're in a different role, you're, you're, you're the coach and, you know, a lot of people look up to you now, your students look up to you now and what are some of the, you know, what are some of the feelings that you feel when you look at your, your you know, your, your journey so far um, and, you know, obviously your story's not done because, Obviously, a lot of people don't know, but even when, uh, even before I got to meet you, and you know, I knew of you, um, you know, you um, you appear in a lot of the the UFC table talks as well. Um, you know, especially for the, a lot of the the events that are in Australia and whatnot. You know, um, you kind of dive deep into a lot of those fights. So, what 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 are some of the thoughts in your head, and what are some of the things that you kind of pass on to your students based on your experience? Because I mean, obviously they're coming at a different time; they're never going to know the, the struggle that you yeah. went through, right? Now, for first, you know, but um, you know, there must be a wealth of knowledge, and you know, and and when you kind of look at you know Elvis as a person, and 
and, and what you've been through, what, what are some of the thoughts that come to your mind, um, you know, when you kind of look back? And well, that, that's, it's uh, quite a, a broad question. There's yeah. a lot, uh, and I'll do my best to cover it without yeah. boring everyone. <laughs> um, obviously, back when I was, I, I consider myself very lucky. Mm. Uh, I got an opportunity to do something that really has panned out. You know, I look back and I'm a pioneer of not just MMA, but, you know, jiu-jitsu and grappling and um, help build what we have today in the community that's now developed and evolved and, and the platform that I set up has allowed to springboard the champions that we have today. And it's pretty crazy. Sometimes even I have to kind of take a step back and go, wow, you know, mm. I... I I find it hard to, to believe I did that. Obviously, at the time, you know, I wasn't thinking to myself, I'm going to be a pioneer, I'm doing this. To, at the time, it was just that just journey of, of self-discovery. Yeah. Mm. It was a journey of discovery of a, a sport I really enjoyed. It was about learning about myself and, and trying different things and just, you know, also after a point, it became about building a future and... Um, helping those and that slowly evolved into helping other people and helping them build the future and so yeah it's just very lucky and as you mentioned um, you know I, I have a very strong relationship with the UFC I've been involved with them um, so my first fight in the UFC was UFC 30 which was also the very first time Zufa took over had purchased mm. the UFC from SEG. Mm. So I was there on the ground floor with Zufa as, as they um, took on um, <clears throat> the UFC brand and then, then they're the ones that really pushed it into um, stardom. They put the money behind it. Um, I think they bought it for like three million dollars and sold it for four billion dollars um, and it, you know it's still grow going strong and continuing to, to grow and evolve. Um, because of that I've been very lucky. I've been to every single UFC event um, here in Australia. You know, the UFC have looked after me. I, I've got to attend those as an ex-fighter, obviously. I also got involved on the first ever UFC TV show, uh, Fight Week, that was on Fox Sports for the, um, the, the five years or whatever that UFC was on Fox. You know, I, I got involved. I got to talk about the sport I love. I got to break it down and share it to the fans and help spread <clears throat> what the UFC is about and how it, how it works and what's going on in the cage and, you know, pass on my knowledge. I'm very lucky in that regard. So, again, it's another area I got to be a pioneer with, with the sport in a different <clears throat> element, um, obviously with coaching, with, with training. Um, it's just an absolutely amazing experience. And, you know, I, I, I take that and I let... I try and pass on to my students that, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, if I can achieve all that with what little resources I had available to me, the way I had to put it together, that they can achieve anything with the resources that they have available to them now. I mean, particularly mm. in this sport, um, you know, we, we have the great, great champions like Alex, uh, um, the ex-champions like Rob, and then we've got a lot of up-and-comers and, -comers and mm. big names in the, the men's and the women's divisions who are still making um, <clears throat> waves inside the UFC. So, you know, it's great. Then you add on um, also guys like Martin Ewan, who's the, mm. the one champion, and then mm. um, Janae, who's the fighting in Bellator, and then... Um, Angel Fist also, you know, mm. uh, we've got Bellator and then One and UFC and a lot of Australians making um, waves across, you know, the world. The globe, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, in all the, all the major organisations. Uh, you know, it's great to see and, you know, I like to let my students, they know they can achieve that. But also a lot of what I've learnt, the resilience, the dedication, the drive is not only applicable to what we do on the mat and the cage, but to your life. own life. It's yeah. like I've taken all these, I take these same principles, I apply it to my home life, my business life, you know, the way I run my social media, the way I run my administration, the way, you know, I have a beautiful house, family, um, 
you know, and it's because of what I've learned from the martial arts and applied to that. Um, I have a successful business because of what I've learned in the martial arts, that dedication, that drive, that determination, um, breaking things down, putting things, separating things, bringing them back together, putting them together so you have a, a complete package applies to so many different parts of life and I've learned that all on the mat. So the, the knowledge I'm passing on here, people can take and apply to their lives. And I say this a lot and it's like, you know, it's great seeing um, the successful fighters I have, um, the athletes that I help, you know, win belts and titles and medals. And, um, but the reality is a lot of those guys who are being successful would be successful in most places. You know, they have, they have that drive, that the determination, the work ethic, um, their athleticism, and given the right coaching, they're going to succeed. What really inspires me is the people that don't have that who come to me and then they see success in their lives, whether it's the, the children that come in who build self-confidence, um, who come here and they learn respect and discipline and they take that to their home life or to their school life so their grades start to improve, um, they become more social, they make more friends because they get used to being um, in an environment here, they do better at school because they learn to listen, they understand the culture um, and then you know the adults who come here to build self-confidence, maybe they've been in abused or difficult as children and it's affecting them as an adult they get their confidence back here or maybe they put on too much weight they come here they come to an environment that's supportive that they can uh, train and exercise and feel like part of a community because one of the hardest things is going to a gym and you don't know anyone there and you feel like everyone's staring at you you know you're, you're lifting your weights and you're wondering what everyone else is doing because you're not part of that. Mm. Unless you've got a training partner or a couple of friends that you're training with, you, you almost can feel isolated. Mm. Whereas places like this and even UFC gym, and um, they, have, they try and build that train like a fighter, which mm. is also trained in that fighter's community. Because um, one of the things I say is fighting um, to be successful is an individual pursuit mm. but it is built off the shoulders of your training partners mm, I like it that. doesn't yeah. matter how skillful or technical you are if you don't have the training partners there You're to support you and lift partners. you exactly exactly yeah, yeah. so you need to build that community and that community mm. can help people not just be successful fighters but be better people mm. um, and i guess that's the biggest thing that really makes me proud is seeing the better people I can produce from children to adults and seeing the positivity. Just the correlation change. of just the training and life, right? It's just amazing. That's what I love about martial arts is just how much life and, and martial arts, they just, they so, they speak the same lingo when you really, you know, dive into it. Um, and, um, and I think that, and, and I think that's great, given, especially as well, like given your origins of, you know, saying being picked on, it must give you such a thrill to, to see the confidence in kids and, and adults that don't have that confidence and then you see that transition come to light as well um but elvis i just want to thank you so much for uh you know giving your time and i know you i know you're a busy man and you got probably students coming in soon as well um but i just want to thank you so much for giving your time and, um, you know and appreciate you um you know sharing your stories and um and i can't wait for the for, for the audience to to be able to sit down and you know and listen and, and be inspired because uh, i think um you know, um, we need to start part of my platform and part of my brand is I, um, I've created it because I believe that, yeah, in, in the ins and outs and through conversations and people, you know what people have done um, for the Australian culture, whether it's, you know, like I said, sport, music, whatnot. But um, I believe that we need to be, we need to celebrate that. And, and that's kind of my vision and, and what I want to do. And um, and um and you're a big part of that when it comes to mma and then that's why i was kind of chasing you down um to sit down with you so um, um i want to thank you again and um and i wish you all the best and i can't wait to see um you know obviously you you're moving in with gyms and you know you've got you know off camera obviously you've told me some of the uh some of the the, the businesses that you're involved with and um and i can't wait to see that come into fruition and and uh see you keep producing i guess you know future future champions well thank you for letting me um have a chat and uh, hopefully I haven't bored everyone. I, I can get carried away. I, I am a talker and that's probably why I did so well on, yeah. on TV. Um, 
So for those that read comic books, this would be what we would call my origin story. So <laughs> look, it's just the start of how things began and where we got to today, but there's still so much more to talk about. Um, you know, there's so much going on in the, in the world and yeah. um, other things in the story that we, you know, didn't get around to talking mm. about. So hopefully they enjoyed it. And if mm. the people did enjoy it, um, they want to hear more. Hopefully down the track, yeah. we can do a, we'll do a follow up and definitely get a little bit more information out there. Talk about a few other things um, that I've experienced uh, mm. through my career and lifetime and, and what's going on in the future. Mm. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, if you are in the Liverpool area or anywhere in Sydney, you just want to pop in. We do have uh, an open door policy. Guests are always welcome. Come down to King's Academy um, in Moorbank. You can find us on kingsacademy.com.au. You'll find our website. We've got all the information and links to, to find us here on Google Maps and, and all, all that sort of stuff. <clears throat> For those that are interested in classes, we have kids' classes, adults' classes, as I mentioned, jiu-jitsu, Muay Thai, boxing, wrestling, MMA. We have a hot yoga program. Um, I'm very big um, on, we can talk a little bit yeah, about yeah, uh, nutrition and recovery and some of the things we do. We have an ice bath, a sauna, the hot yoga, a strength and conditioning room, a hyperbaric oxygen chamber. You know, I'd like to talk about some of that stuff because I, you know, I find that, uh, that stuff um, very interesting and that's why I kind of like to provide it mm. uh, to my students. So, so much to talk about and, I, and I'm getting carried away and we're supposed to be closing up <laughs> no, here. No, no, that's so all right. That's once all right. again, thank we'll you very much. No, definitely looking out for a part two. There's mate. only one way yeah. to end it and as I always start yeah. and finish, it's good to be the king. <laughs> Thanks, sir.